Okay, what we're going to do, we're going to go for two things today. We're going to go for unit 63 and unit 25 as well. Uh, something from there as well. Uh, recording is being saved. It stops recording. Okay, so um, now I gave, I handed out an assignment um, a, a bit of a while ago and um, it was given to you via Teams and it was assignment two for unit 63. Now after half term, uh, the assignment is sometimes is due. So what I want to do, I want to go through the actual assignment about a week after half term is due. So what I want to do is I want to go through um, the assignment for unit 63 because it's a very quick assignment. And um, I did actually go through it in the lesson as well. Last time we had Unit 63, which was on the Friday, a couple of Fridays ago, I actually uh, went through the, um, the the assignment. And then I'm going to go on to um, Unit 25, OK? So let's just begin, first of all, OK? So it's a bit of a change of, of schedule to an extent, but just to keep you up, all updated. So we're going to go to here. I'm going to go to Teams. I'm going to go to... Could you all send me your names on chat, please? So, so I could, I can just take this. So I'm going to do the register, you know, and it's all up to date. OK, good. Now in Teams, um, if you go to class notes, Go to content and go to unit 63 first of all okay now the assignment was sent to you on teams so you um hopefully some of you would have would have started it okay it was sent on teams but anyway it's, it's in here anyway it's in assignments and um it's it's their assignment unit 63 and assignment to synchronous motors now i put on the um, on the assignment tab that i've created I put on all the information you need to help you answer the question for the assignment. So I'm going to go for one or two things. Most of it I actually have gone through, but one or two things I haven't quite touched upon too much. So let me just open up the assignment. Just bear with me whilst I'm downloading the assignment. Can you see the assignment? Is it displaying? Yeah. Oh, good. Okay, so it's it was actually handed out on the twenty second, and it's due on the twenty second as well. Okay, so let me just go go down, and um, so basically you've you've just got two tasks to do in the in the assignment. It's P3 and it's M3 in terms of its assessment objective. Okay, um, so um, let's let's go. I think it's just two tasks. Yes, it is two tasks. Now, so let's go for the first one. Okay, produce a detailed drawing for a typical three-phase synchronous motor. Include labeled parts. Now, I'm going to open up a PowerPoint presentation because this is actually also on a PowerPoint presentation. So I'm going to open up um, the ones that we normally use in lesson time. All right. Can you all see a PowerPoint presentation? Yeah. Yeah. OK, now this is um, we, we, you should be familiar with this. This is only for syn um, synchronous motors. OK, and um, and it's got all the information you need. Like it's got your synchronous motor, all the parts with the full, full labels as well. And then it goes through the applications of each part. OK, as you go further down. OK, and um, it, goes for the main parts, okay, as you, as you go further and further down. So this basically, uh, you can use the information that I've given you. Also, I'd like you to use the other information I've given you as well on Teams, and you can use your own information as well to be able to answer that question, okay? So I'm going to go back now. We'll go back onto um, the PowerPoint. 
sorry, on the, the, the assignment, which is there. Should be an assignment now. This now any questions so far? You all okay with that? Yeah. Next, it says yeah. Explain how three three phase um, synchronous motor operates using relevant terminology. Also describe the effect of speed in relation to load within working boundaries. Now, as we know with the synchronous motor, if you put load in the synchronous motor, the speed doesn't change. It's not like an induction motor, okay? Um, so it stays the same. So it, it doesn't affect the speed within within the boundaries, okay? It doesn't stay the same. And we mentioned before, like uh, quite often lifts use um, synchronous motors because if you've got one person in a lift or 10 people in a lift, the, the, the idea the motor speed stays exactly the same all the time. So um, anything where you require constant speed, regardless of the load, we, do, we, do, we would use a synchronous motor. And uh, we've got from here as well, if you've got, um, um, let's see, starting of synchronous motor, you've got information there. Then you've got step-by-step -step information here, how each part works. Because what you've got, you, you've got to, you've got, you got really um, two way, two parts, two main parts of a synchronous motor. Let me just go and get it for you. You got your what we call um, you got your you got your prime mover, which moves um, the um, once you put supply a three feet three feet power supply into the starter windings, they get magnetized. You got to move this big heavy metal object in the middle as well. Okay. Now you got to give that a kick start, so you need something called a prime mover. That can be a second, a second smaller motor attached to it temporarily. Okay. Um, then what happens is as this moves um, and it reaches and this spins at similar speed to the to the to the um, stator winding uh, magnetic field. You you supply, say for example, a DC voltage to the north and south pole. It becomes magnetized. Then that magnet, when it becomes magnetized, that north locks onto south, and south locks onto north. There's many of these, not just one like here. And when it locks on, it then it then then you can switch the prime mover off, and then it will spin with the synchronous motor. It's literally be locked on. So you got something called um, something called a start a starter, and you got something called an exciter. So and they're, and they're giving you a detailed example of that um, somewhere here. OK, you've got a DT exciter and you've got a starter. So the starter gets it spinning and the exciter locks, locks the magnets, the two magnets together. It energizes this with a DC voltage, which is the router magnet. Mag energy locks it to the north and south of the um, starter magnets, um, magnetic field, and then it moves constantly. Then you don't really need the starter anymore. That gets disconnected. So the thing with an asynchronous motor, you need more equipment to get it to work. Okay, but they are very efficient motors. Okay, they are very efficient motors. Um, so that's basically what it works. Now there are different ways to start a motor, and different ways you can excite it as well, which is what we're going to be doing in the bit. Okay, so let's go back to um, PowerPoint. Describe the purpose of excitation and list three main methods of exciting excitation of, of a three phase. A motor, okay. Um, so if you go back to the PowerPoint here, there's a, there's a, a sheet here. Excitation. You can copy this down. There are three main methods of excitation: DC excitation, AC excitation, or static excitation. And it's asking you what the what's the purpose of the excitation. So the purpose of the excitation, um, um, there might be an information from a DC excited. There is some information here on Excite. I can't something inside here, but basically the purpose of it is to lock um, the the route the rotor mag magnets, energize them, turn them into magnets because it's an electromagnet system inside there. So you've got to put um, electricity through the coils that turns them into magnets, and then the magnets then therefore lock onto the um, the, the magnetic field of of the stator windings. So that's the purpose of the excitation system, okay? But the different ways to excite it, but generally you need to um, mag you need to magnetize the 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 um, the, the, the ion poles inside of, which are attached to the router that spin, okay? That's what you need to do, and there's lots of information available on that on the internet about excitation systems. 
and the, and the basic concepts behind it. Okay. Are you, any questions so far? Are you guys okay? Yeah. That's all you need to do for that part here. Nothing else. Okay. Um, and then if you can include diagrams, that's really good. The more diagrams you include with labels as well and parts, that's really, really good for, for evidence as well. Okay. Um, and this, this goes for um, what you sh make sure when you do any assignment that you look at the assessment criteria, because uh, this is given by BTEC, not by the teacher. The questions are given by the teacher, but the BTEC is what gives the assessment criteria. So I make sure that it fulfills that as much as possible because that's what gets you your mark. Okay. And then task two, a bit more detail. You got to describe the methods of operation of a DC of DC and various DC and various HC excitation systems. Use diagrams where necessary. With the AC system, a bush excitation must be included. Okay. So now this is similar to this question here. Question part three of task one, very similar. But here you've got to talk about it in more detail in terms of his actual mode of operation here. And that myth, I think that mentioned it here, effects of its various excitation. OK, so you've got to um, talk about this in more detail. Now, it's quite now. If you look at the PowerPoint, OK, I have mentioned I have given you some stuff on excitation and uh, but it's quite hard to actually um, to un to understand it. So DC excitation is what you've got is when you attach positive and ne negative electricity going to the brushes of the router and they excite the, the, the magnets that revolve. So it's a simple concept. It's just DC. Um, ex that's what DC excitation system is. The problem is you've got brushes, these brushes here, carbon brushes, and they wear out after a while. So the so after so people realize that this is not a very efficient method because you've got to keep replacing these parts, and um, it's just it, you know it's a good concept it works really well, but you know it's just these parts they keep wearing out after a certain period of time, so it becomes costly over long periods of time. Do you all understand that? Yeah. 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 You can copy these parts down as well. This information down to answer that question. So the, f the figure that other ways of exciting motors, OK? Now, here I've given some examples on how to how, how they work. You won't understand the diagrams really well. So what I'm going to I'm going to go through just the very basics. I'm going to give you a different example, OK? I've given you some really good examples um, um, here. So if you, you just have to search for it, OK? Um, I, I've labeled things quite well. The DC excitation system. So what you've got is quite clever. You take the power that you're going to use for your synchronous motor because people realize with a DC excitation system, you've got to supply a separate DC voltage source to uh, the slip rings, to the brushes, which attach into the slip rings. So you're using two different power sources, you're using the, the AC three-phase power source to, to, to start this, to, 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 to begin uh, the power for the synchronous motor because it is a three-phase motor. You know, for the stator windings, and a separate one for um, the the slip rings. So why not just do? Why not just use one power source? Makes a lot of sense. So you're taking the same power source that you're using for the supply voltage. You put it through a transformer. It's called an excitation transformer. I put it through some safety circuits. So this is a step down transformer. It takes a high voltage, makes it into a lower voltage. So this would be like um, a three phase voltage. OK, you should know about three phase voltage now. It reduces it. It's still AC. This rectifier circuit here, which I've been told about, you should know about from electronics, but a rectifier, all it does, it, it converts um, it converts AC into DC. So you've got AC, you've got three phase power supply go along these three pairs of rectifiers. And at the end, you get just a normal DC voltage. And that DC voltage is attached for, for DC excitation. Do you all understand that concept? Yeah. 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 You got something called IGBT. So what what the what this basically what this in effect does this um, switches on and off the the the, um, the DC voltage going along here. So you can so you can you can you can control the amount of excitation. You can make it overexcite, less excite. 
because sometimes you've got to keep the excitation level and you don't want, and you can increase the voltage or you could decrease the voltage okay so um it depends on on, on what you on what your needs are so as you switch on and off this transistor here okay what you've got is um you can um basically you can play with the voltage here okay that's the idea behind it now this this device does that for you okay it's an it's an automatic voltage regulator so this regulates um it's like you see pulses sends pulses to here and that switches on and off the dc voltage across here so that's a dc excitation system so you can use this diagram as well to help you okay i'm going to show you a link where you can get that as well in more detail if you go back to here it says here um ac excitation system use different use diagrams when necessary with ac excitation with the AC, AC excitation system, um, a brushless excitation system must be used. Now, what we've got, if you go back into, into the PowerPoint here, they, they've got systems now, which is more common now, where you don't need these brushes. You can actually energize the, 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 um, the electromagnets inside the router without connecting anything physical to it, without doing any, any uh, connecting any brushes. Uh, so this is a, a different type of technology, um, which is basically more efficient and it's more popular now. Um, DC excitation systems actually a thing of the past now. It's going to be old school. So what we're going to do is um, the um, is this here. So you've got AC excitation, you've got brushless excitation, and you've got static as well. Now I'm going to go for. You don't have to actually talk about both of these. Just talk about B, the brushless one. Okay, this one here. Uh, it's, it's becoming more common okay so now with the brushless excitation system um to, to get information for that is let me just give you an example one second okay there's a few you can do a lot of um research on the internet for this one that this explains to you um the, the the theory behind it okay now i'm going to show you something now i'm going to go back into teams Gonna watch a video. I'm not sure if you can see me. Am I on Teams with you guys now? Yeah. Oh, I am on Teams. Like, can you all see that I'm on Teams? Yeah? Am yeah. I on Teams, yeah? Yeah. Good. Now, in Teams, in um, well, I've got the dates completely wrong there. What the heck is that? In week 19, which is supposed to be this week, I've got <laughs> week beginning. Oh, yeah, week beginning 8th of February, which is this week. Okay, now I've got some stuff here which you can look at. Um, there's a video on how, how the AC excitation brush list actually works. Okay, it's a really clever concept. Um, um, so I'm going to try and play this, okay, and then it's, it's a bit of a weird voice, but it's actually the best one of all the uh, videos I could get, I could find. This is actually a really good concept. The idea is, um, what energizes the, 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 the magnets in the router is not a physical connection, okay? It's actually, um, what you've got is, um, magnetism magnets okay it's magnetism that magnetic field um goes onto the on, onto the onto the router windings and then and it produces electricity by uh, in, in some kind of reduction so i'm going to just show you this now and then I'm, just let me know if you can hear it can you hear it can you hear it yeah no oh you can't yeah i've had this problem because when you when you play videos on, on here you can't physically hear them can you i've had this issue before okay the, what this this basically explains um quite a lot so if you go through this you'll be able to understand ac excitation really 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 well okay um and so if you just go forward a tiny bit i'm gonna go um one second one second
It's about there. One second. Can you see the video? OK, what you've got here is this. Um, as as the rotor spins, what happens is this. You've got a device here and um, that gets energized with AC electricity as it spins through, through, through uh, the, ma the magnetism across here to here. It, it produces an um, electric field. So you've got some kind of induction happening and there's a diode here. These diodes it's called the wheel diode wheel. That diode wheel takes that AC, converts it into DC automatically, and that sends that DC to the router magnetic magnet instead. So it's a very clever way. So there's no physical contact. There's a gap in between there, and that sends um, it's a it, and but that magnetic field uh, creates AC electricity, and the AC electricity is converted to DC by this thing that spins in the middle here. This this called a diode wheel, and that diode wheel takes that DC electricity and sends that to, to the router magnets. OK, it's so all it does, nothing else. That's the most simple way to explain it, because a lot of people explain it in a very complicated way. Now, a lot of information that you find on um, AC excitation systems is to do with generators. Now, we're working with motors here, and so um, you need to, to make it a bit simpler. So that's the, the this, this video explains it really, really well, OK? Secondly, I've got a link here I'm going to go to in a second now. Bear with me. Now, this this is by a company. You don't need to worry about uh, most of the stuff on here. Wait a minute. Wait, is this it? Excitation system. Just, just wait. Sorry, it's a bit slow. Let's see. Uh, but there's some some issue. Normally, this link takes you straight um, to um, the information that I really want you to. Um, So just just bear with me because this normally takes straight to um, excitation systems, what they are, everything about them. OK, oh, there you go. You have to just find it, I guess. OK, it goes through different circuits for DC and AC excitation systems, and it gives you the basic explanation. It gives you something called static and excitation system as well. Now, the static is very similar to DC, OK, um, but it just uses slightly different technology. It's a bit simpler, OK, um, but it's not as efficient. So all you need to do is basically you can copy the diagram down. You can do and you can just talk about the basic information here. OK, um, so just um, this is just examples where you can get from that link. Now what I want to do is um, go back onto here. I want to go through starters, explain the purpose of a starter of three phase motor and list various starting methods. Now we've said before starter, what it does is spins the router at the beginning. It spins it, OK? It's something like it's like it's like a kickstart. Um, now there's there's different types of starters. Pony starters, you can you can copy this down. OK, um, these are different types of starters, but the ones that we normally talk about are pony starters and damper windings. And we talked about damper windings. We had the entire lesson of this. And there's a PowerPoint specifically about damper windings that I've created as well. OK. So you really need to talk about these two in more detail, not these lot. You can talk about them basically by doing some research if you want, OK? And, you know, there's uh, no point me going to it now. It'll be here for a long time. But you can, but the, a pony motor is just basically a, like an induction motor connected to a router, and that spins the router. So when it reaches the, the almost the same speed as the stator windings, the, the, the motor switches off the induction motor. Then you excite the router, then that kicks then that locks everything on and it continues on from there. OK, um, so there's a lot. Uh, I, I do actually have stuff in within these PowerPoints as well regarding um, uh, pony motors. 
And then you've got damper windings as well. And a damper winding uses an induction system. Now, a while ago, um, I gave you a lesson on damper windings, what they were. It's, it's in the PowerPoint. And if I, if I go onto Teams, go back into Assignments, and go to, um, there you go, damper windings there. So I've get, there's information here, brushless excitation system and damper windings. So you find everything in these PowerPoints here. So damper windings is different is a different way of starting a, um, a motor without using um, without without using separate induction motor. Um, okay, it's a very ingenious concept and it's used a lot now in in in, in technology. Okay, that's what's what it does because it acts basically it's an induction motor. And if you go into here a bit, I'll just open it up very quickly. Remember, I was doing a lesson on this a while ago. The last time I taught you, actually, we did this. Um, so there's two ways to start, so two main ways to start a, um, a synchronous motor. You've got external prime mover, like a pony motor, and you've got damper windings. And with damper windings, it's this set of like an induction motor. These are your damper windings here connected. So what happens is when you supply electric, when the starter windings get magnetized, okay, what happens that that movement in magnetism creates electricity across the, across the, the squirrel cage here, okay. Now these squirrel cages are connected one end to the other by something called damper windings. That creates electricity, okay. That electricity, in turn, what it does. It creates um, what we call electrical field, which which makes the rotor spin. It acts very similar to a normal induction motor, and so and so that's what damper windings really are. Okay, it's just a really clever way to start a motor. So and then when 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 the um, rotor starts spinning at 97 percent of the speed of the starter windings, um, what happens is. The, the excitation system then kicks in and it, and it energizes, magnetizes the rotor magnets. Okay, so this is the concept of damper windings. And we did this might be recorded this lesson because we did do, do a really good lesson on this, and this explains a lot in detail as well. Okay, and um, you've got here describe the pony method and damper windings. Okay, so this is what that is. So that's taken from the PowerPoints. And you can you can do a lot of research about pony methods. Very easy to find pony motors. Then you've got something called a V curve. Look at the V curve diagram below. This talks about current. Now, with the last lesson we had, we talked about um, what we call unity power factor. Um, you should always have a power factor of one. So if you if you remember, I'm going to go back to you in a second. Okay, let's just go to. Um, back into teams and go go on to this power um powerpoint here one second get this powerpoint well, we gave an example of power factor where we said that like, if you got say a glass of beer or whatever okay uh, you got three types of power You've got something called a power power, active power, and reactive power. Reactive power is not useful power, but it happens. But it's good for magnet. It's good for generating magnetism. Okay, so it's good for motors. But anyway, but the more active power you have, the more close it's going to be to a power power. If all of that was active power, then you'd have a power factor of one. It's like a ratio. Okay, the closer you get to one, the more efficient and power. Um, and things um, machines work okay so that's what we had here so you can read about this now this gives you a lot of information about power factor and um, we talked about la lagging and leading where well, how how do you get um um how how do you, how do you have this power factor increase or decrease it's all to do with um the, the voltage and the current because normally the voltage and current waveforms always happen together but in motors, um, quite a lot of machines, the voltage and the current do not happen at the same time. 
So what happens, the, the current appears before the voltage is called leading current. So you get something called the leading power factor. If the current gets happens after the voltage, you get something called lagging. That's like a lagging power factor it's called. Okay. So that's just that's just um this is just terminology. Okay. Um so that's the idea behind it. So what we've got is um so you can just read this in a bit more detail. Now what what you've got with the V curves is this. Now to get unity power factor, the excitation system, which is what this is, um, has got to have has got to have a certain balance. Okay, so if the, if the armature current, which is the current of the stator, okay, is around here, and the field current is is a bit less, if you increase the field current, you decrease the armature current, and there's a point where in the middle at this point here you get something called unity power factor and this is really what you want this is with no load if you put the more load you put on the more weight you put onto the motor the v curve just moves up now what you can do is um you can do calculations for, for the to get this v curve or what you can do is you can um you can you can get a, a measuring a current measuring device and see where the current goes down and when it goes back up again. And that middle part there is your um, is your power factor, is, is the best value. Now, it's all to do with excitation. When you when you put excitation voltage into your router, you can you can go over excitation or under excitation. In fact, it tells you here. Does it tell you there? One second. Um, it doesn't tell you here. Now you can move back and forth by doing something called overexcitation, where you put extra voltage into your router a magnet, ma uh, router into the router magnets, electromagnets, or you can put lesser voltage. So you can do a balance to get th the middle part here. Okay, that's the idea. That's what this V curve shows. Okay, where the balance of the power factor is, and this is what the graph should look like if you were to take temperature. Uh, current measurements okay that's all it does so um if you go back into the um onto here that's what that is here it says explain the effects of power factor at various excitation levels under excitation uh, equal excitation over excitation so exp explain the effects of power factor at various excitation levels so when it's under excitation okay the power factor okay you're going to have something called um um, a lagging power factor. When it's over excitation, you're going to have something called a leading power factor. And when it's equal excitation, which is like part in the middle, okay, what you're going to have, you're going to have, um, it's, you, you're going to have actually um, a unity power factor. Okay, that's the idea behind it. And you want to try to get um, equal ex excitation as much as possible. So you, you have to adjust the currents of the um, of the field windings. Of the excitation system to get to get it in the middle because as you change the load the current will change so you've got to try to keep it in the middle but the move the motor does it by itself there's electronic circuitry in the motor most of them that does it automatically but just for you to be aware of okay so a lot of the stuff is on, on teams in, in, in quite a lot of detail okay um but we did lessons on this you can go back to lessons as well we did a whole lesson on the power factor leading and lagging it took me about an hour, so and also damper windings and stuff. Um, so, any questions, people? You guys okay? Yeah. Everybody okay? Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, unit unit twenty five. Uh, we missed a couple of lessons of unit twenty five actually, and that's the. That's the PLC. That's the um, PLC lesson. I think we have, yeah. And so we want to try. And, we need to get back on to onto track with the PLC lessons, okay? Because because they're a bit difficult if you're not physically have a PLC in front of you to be able to do any work. And so what I've done here is I've I've put some stuff from week 19, which is this week, week beginning the 8th of February, just for just for us to go through. And um, so you're gonna like. 
it's, it's a long thing. I don't think we're going to be able to do this today because uh, we've, we've taken the first part of the lesson quite a lot, okay? Um, but I'm going to go through something here, okay? So I'm going to go through distribution station. Um, one second. No open some documents. Right. In in the workshop, we've got various distribution stations and so various worked um, um, automation systems. And this is the simplest one. It's called the distribution system. Now, what this does, it takes and you put objects inside here, this tube. This cylinder pushes the objects forward. When the object's gone forward, this arm moves this way. It uses an um, um, electro pneumatics now. So what it does, it creates a vacuum. It sucks the object, okay, then places it onto this area here. This is, is a, you know, there's, just, there's nothing here on the picture, but it places it to a different um, station here. So basically, it's moving objects back and forth. It's all it's doing, nothing else. So there's very sensors involved, and um, now what you what you have to you got to figure out, okay, when you, and you if you're in a workshop what the inputs are, what the outputs are, what the sensors are. You can, you've got your schematic diagrams, which you get with these, okay? And um, so you've got to be able to read basic schematic diagrams to have an idea of what inputs and outputs are. Now, they, they look they look a bit complicated, okay? But once, you, once, you be able to, once you're able to read them, they're not really that complicated, okay? Um, some of the stuff you might recognize from from lesson times okay so if you go for example here what you've got you've got read switches then you've got um, a limit switch this is the limit switch okay then you've got um then you've got these when it's got this picture of, of lights going out of a diode okay now this is so this is going to be some kind of um it's going to be a um like an opt um an optical sensor so you got one, two, got three, four. These are normal switches, limit switches. So you got one, two, three, four, five, six. You got seven input devices. You got seven inputs going attached onto that rig. So you got an idea, okay? And then if you go to the other part, okay? And I think it says here at the bottom outputs, okay? So then you got or how many outputs have you got? So if you got this symbol, that's solenoid. So I've got one here. One here, one, two, three, four outputs here. So you've got out four output devices. So you automatically know you've got this many input devices and you've got that many output devices. But you don't know which is the input, which is the output yet. You've got to play with the system. And then what you can do afterwards when you've done that, okay, you can actually um you can you can find out which um PLC input and output um it's, it's which which I which which module number it's connected to, and then you can write on here the name of of the description of the input and the description of the output here. Okay, from that you can start basically planning. This is your tag table, so you can create a tag table, and from that you can start planning your programming from there. Okay, that's the idea behind it. Now it, it's a bit of work to to get to that stage, to get to this stage because there's a lot of playing around with the system. Like for example, if you if you press a button on the workstation, a light will switch on the PLC. Then you'll know, okay, that's an input, input two, so it's I zero point two. Or what input is that? Or oh, that's a, that's a switch, that's a limit switch to see if the arm has gone all the way to the right. So you put right arm switch. Do you all understand that? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah? Yeah, so you you and there's other ways you and when it comes to outputs, it's hard switching outputs on. So we force outputs to switch on, and we have a device where we can connect, um, where where we switch outputs on. Then you can see which outputs switch on. Then you can write it on here which outputs switch on to which particular um port number on on the PLC. So then then you can produce something something called then then you've got your tag table in there as well. Okay, so that's done as well. Then you can start doing your program. Now, what you then what you would do? You start, you do a flowchart. 
a flow diagram. <clears throat> now this is the flow diagram for that particular program at the for that workstation. It's just a full one. Okay, it's a full flow diagram. We did the flow diagrams before, but this is quite a detailed one. Okay, so you start off with a with a position. Okay, and it says station is reset and initial position. You can ignore this part here because that's quite confusing to explain. Okay, you can go straight to this part here, and you can say is is empty steps magazine empty? Is it not empty? No, is it a workpiece? Is it no workpiece. If it's a workpiece, then it, it will do this. Um, it will suck, move the arm. It will suck. There is no workpiece. Wait for the workpiece. When the workpiece happens, then it push it forward, and then so you can. See, this is an example of a flowchart which you can cut, which you can follow to an extent, and um, and then you can put that in your assignment as well. Then you can make your own version to make it more simple to understand. Then from that you can draw, make make a program. Okay. Now I'm going to just go for something very simple, simple with you in PLC. It's a very quick program thing. Now. Uh, Sorry, I'm going away now. One second. So it's my fault. Where was I? Just, just bear with me, okay? I've gone away from the from the spreadsheets, from the Word documents, from the Adobe files, or we're just using. Just, just bear with me. I don't know where they are. Right. Now, if you just what it is, you, you'd program the operation of this, but there's two parts to this. The second part you don't see. The, the other part is what we call the control station, the control box. And the control box has the key and it has a start and stop button. It has a reset, it has lights as well. So you switch it on by using the control box. Now, some some of the requirements in the program that ask you to make a system automatic and sometimes make it manual. An automatic system is what will happen is as long as you've got pieces inside the chute, these are going to keep moving the pieces back and forth, pieces from there to there, there to there, there to there. A manual system is it will only um, move the piece from here to here if you press a button. OK, so that's what like a stop button. Stop, then it'll do it. So you've got control. Automatic system, you don't have any control. So how do you make something to start? How do you make something automatic and manual in a, in a program? So I'm going to show you that in a very simple way. Um, this um, so I'm going to show you in a second. So I'm going to go into paint. Right, you all see me, I'm on paint. Am I in paint, yeah? Yeah. Okay. And explain what, I'm going to show you what I mean by that. Um, let me just change the color of this, not the color, but the thickness is easy to work with it, it's thicker. Now watch this. On all the rigs in the workshop, okay, there's a control box. The control box has a start button. It's a start, I put S there. It has a reset. And it has and it has a key. This is the key. OK, you can change the position of the key. You can change it to automatic. And you can make it into manual M. It's just how you, oh, that's not in line with the key. But anyway, it depends on the position of the key. Now that actually is an input, it's, it's just an input. OK, that's an input, that's an input. These are just actual individual inputs of the PLC. OK, but it's quite clever how it's done. Now, what you do is, if you do a program here, watch this. Start. OK. Uh, 
and um, and that will say So what will happen is if these two on, maybe it'll switch on an output and it'll move to, to a different state to, and then the program here. Okay, if you're gonna use this concept here. Now, in fact, no, I'm gonna do I'm gonna do that's just start the bug here. This is gonna be your um this is gonna be your compare. Let's see this is like compare zero. This is stage zero, okay, the first level, okay. And then the, the next stage will be like compare um, that one CMP one compare one. OK, so that will move to um, put one in there. Into a uh, into a particular address location in W, wherever it could be. And then that will compare that in many MW if that one goes into there, that means it's ready to go to the stage one. So compare one stage one's there, then that will do whatever you want it to do. This is, how you, that's, this is called sequential programming. It's the easiest way to program to go to different stages. Now what would happen is this is the start button here, that's your S. OK, now this, for example, could be your um, this could be your manual. Now that could be say I 1.2. Say it's I 1.2 just for purposes, OK? So what would happen is this. Now that's a push button, that start button is a push button. So if if that key. If now, now what you've got is got automatic and manual. So. You've got two positions, you've got on and off position. So it could be on. Equals manual. off equals automatic that would be normally open and that and that would be normally closed and that is i 1.2 it's also i 1.2 okay sorry about the diagrams okay it's, it's the same input it's just one input, either on or off. So you can, so you got two states of any switch, either on or off. But on the PLC, you can use two states of a switch to do diff two different operations. It's quite clever. So what would happen is, if the start button is pressed and it's a manual position, okay, that's going to be manual. So every time you press that, it will it'll, it'll start the program. Do you all understand that? So you press that because it's a push button. It's not an actual um, toggle switch. It's a push button. So what will happen when that's on and that's on, then that's going to be on here. Do you all understand that here? Yeah, that makes sense. You all OK with that? Yeah, yeah. Now to make it automatic is, is really clever. You forget the start button. That's automatic. That's I. 1.2 i 1.2 normally closed same input norm so what happened is as soon as the program goes back to the beginning after it's done whatever its operation is doing if it bypasses the start button it just starts automatically because you can do that rung or this rung okay so because it, it'll be in this position and the automatic position which should be like the off position and we know it's it's like a not gate when it's when it when it's got a line in it. So it'll, even though it's off, the switch is technically off, it's still on. So what will happen is that's going to be status. That's going to be a one all the time. It's always going to go and do the operation all the time. Do you all understand that? Yeah. You guys are okay with that? Yeah. 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 You guys okay with that, yeah? Yeah. Okay, so this is a simple way of making it manual and making it automatic. You just bypass bypass the start button 
and you made that to an, um, um, normally close. Um, what is it? That's normally closed. So what would happen is when it's open, um, then it will then it will um, work. That's the idea behind it, and that will that will. So when when it's not when the switch is not pressed, then it will um, then it will work. We did a lesson using relays and how how this concept really works in more detail. Okay, if I do it again now, I'll be here forever. But basically, that's the opposite of this for that line in the middle. So that, so if it's in the manual position, it means the input is a high, so it will go there. Now, if the input is a low, it's it's in what we call the automatic position. It's, this is how it's designed. It looks very clever with the key, but it's a very simple concept. There's nothing to it. So if it's in an automatic position, it means the switch is off. So if the switch is off. Good. I'm gonna. This is what I want. I'm gonna go this way instead. I don't need the start button. So that's auto. That's manual and that's automatic. Okay. Uh, then you can do your program after that. Okay. Move to there. Then you can keep moving after that. I'm going to show you a simple example. I'm going to show you an example of the program for, for this. Very simple example. Um, one second. Okay. So can you all see I've got a program on here? Yeah. Yeah. Now, this is similar concept to what I've just explained, but it's just arranged in a different way. It's just using um, so what this it's just different concepts, but it's similar to what I've done. It's very similar to what I've done. You'll find that this, this works as well, and my way way, way works as well. Uh, this is a, this is included the counter. Okay. So um, so what happens is um, whenever it goes into I think it goes into manual. In this case, it, it, it counts. And um, if the count is this case, if it's less, if it's less than, if it's less than three, okay, then it allow, then it outputs to here. But anyway, what you've got, so then you've got your move here. You've got your move. You've got your move to different stages. Okay, so you go to different stages of the program here. Eventually. What happens then you then you eventually you go back to you go back to the beginning eventually so um this is on teams you can look you can follow this program if you want a bit okay and then but we're going to go through it in detail some other time not just yet because it's quite difficult to go through when you don't have actual something simulation working otherwise it can get really confusing so um so this is an example of a program and these are your tags you can label them how you want these are your tags, and you produce a tag table, and then they they get printed out with the program. It depends on where you use them. Okay, so it's, it's quite a simple program, really, compared to the other programs, the other um, other um, 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 devices that we have, other stations that we have. This is the most simple one of all. Okay, so hope hopefully that was quite useful for you. Okay, and so we're going to go back into Teams. To just um, do you have any questions, anyone? Now I'm going to set an assignment for PLC. Now the assignment is going to be electric. It's going to be computer theory because you've got to do some computer theory and it's basically research. It's, it won't actually be PLC programming, but it'll be about um, hardware. It'll be about binary. It'll be about hexadecimal. It'll be about it'll be all computer theory. And so and I'll set that. I'm do, I'm in the process of writing it. I've actually got it, but I need to just format it. So um and I'll look, and I'll go through a lesson on how to complete the assignment. Because that's quite a big assignment, okay, and it's a big theory. We can get that finished. Then, when we get into college, okay, hopefully we can just do practical, and um, which will be assignment two. So I'm going to give you assignment three, which is the final assignment. I'm um, going to give you that early, explain to you how to answer the questions. Then we can go to assignment two, which is the practical part in in college time. Is that okay? Yeah. So while well, I'm going to stop the recording now, and so that and um, you can go back to this whenever you want. Okay, okay, everyone, take care. Bye. Bye.